my, it's my pleasure to, to be here, in, in fact. And, um, I actually, uh, up until a couple of years ago, I, my research lab was actually at, at this university. I, I was in chemical engineering. And then I, I moved my research lab to, to MIT. I'm, I'm currently, uh, my, my lab is currently at, at, at MIT. And um, I'm in the Department of Chemical Engineering. And I'm talking to you to, today about uh, recent developments in the entire field of nanotechnology, where it's becoming very clear nanotechnology is giving us these uh, sensors that can detect and transduce single molecules. So we're, we're at the point where we have technology that can detect the stochastic fluctuations of, of single molecules selectively. We call these sto stochastic sensors, or sen sensors that can um, nanosensors, nanometer size tra transducers that can detect uh, molecules sto stochastically. So I want to, I'll talk to you about this, this field. We'll, we'll look at um, the development and, and, and how biology has played a role in, in shaping our understanding. But, but at, at first, I, I just wanted to take a few slides and uh, talk, talk to you about my, my research in, in general. I mean, I'm, we're in the Cambridge area, and uh, I'm, I'm always looking to recruit new, new, po new postdocs. Some of you who are graduate students, if you're looking to do a postdoc in my laboratory. Uh, this, this area, this is one area that, that I research. It, it actually dovetails with, with, uh, with two uh, ongoing pro projects that, that I have in, in the lab. But generally, my, my lab, I'm interested in what I call the, the chemical engineering of low-dimensional systems. Have, have you heard this term before? Does anyone know what I mean by, by, by low-dimensional systems, low-dimensional electronic systems? Is anyone, how many are familiar with, uh, with, with nanowires or, or nanotubes, carbon nanotubes? Okay, well, we'll go through, yeah. Well, of course, I, I know. I know uh, Chang and Lee in the back, right? right. Okay, good. So the, the idea here is that, so the, the materials we encounter every day have, have electrons, right? Uh, um, there's, there's a nucleus in the atoms and there's electrons. Um, what, what happens in, um, when, you, when you take matter and you pattern it into, a, uh, uh, into, into small domains or, or, or small ge ge geometric spaces, you can actually, what's, what's called quantum, can find the electron. And uh, you're, you can think of this like what, when, you're, when you're thinking of con conventional solids, like conventional metals. If, if you look at how the electrons distribute in, this is supposed to be uh, the energy axis, and this is a density of electronic states. And so mo most of the solid materials that you encounter have, have this kind of smooth distribution in the number of electrons that can, that can occupy a particular energy state. But there, there are these emerging materials that, that nanotechnology is giving us that, that have uh, very interesting quantized states that the electrons can occupy. Don't, don't, uh, don't fret too, too much about the, all, all you really need to know about the, these materials is that they have new and interesting properties and they're really enabling this, this uh, stochastic de detection. Things like graphene, uh, carbon nanotubes, and, and, and quantum dots. My, my uh, research interests are in using these materials like car carbon nanotubes, we'll, we'll talk about them, interesting molecules, for energy applications, we, we, look, we look at exotic energy waves and so forth that you can generate with them. Uh, we, we apply them to bi biological systems as subcellular sensors, fluor fluorescent sensors. Um, we, uh, I, I invented here uh, a novel class of bi biomedical sensors that can de detect glucose. And, and I'm in, in generally, I'm interested in the chemistry of the, these materials, how you, form, how you form bonds and how you break bonds. And, uh, so the, these are the these are the general areas that my lab is working in. We have five five different uh, projects. They 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 span different uh, topics in nanotech technology. They, there there are two that overlap with what I'll talk about today. But one one area is the use of uh, fluorescent carbon nan nanotubes for life sciences, and we're and we're actually studying uh, cell signaling problems using these these single wall car carbon nanotubes that that fluoresce. We're going to talk about that in detail. Um, but I think that they can definitely pr provide a new tool that, that can help us to answer bi biological questions. Um, we, we discovered these energy waves called thermal power waves. We're making new kinds of batteries and fuel cells out of them. We won't talk about that to, to, today. I will talk, talk about using uh, stochastic detection through nanopores. And there have been some big advances re recently, uh, including, including in my own lab laboratory, where we can make nanopores that can literally count single small molecules. 
So you can literally uh, count single single cations of arsenic in drinking water. It's it's uh, it's very very clear that these platforms are going to have an, an effect on science and technology. And then we also work on nanostructures for for solar energy. And uh, I, as as the as the backbone to a number of these projects, I study the chemistry of nanomaterials and how to how to assemble them and how to place them in different in different configurations. Feel free to ask questions. Um, it's a we, we have plenty of time. It's a, I uh, I can easily tolerate an open or interactive for, for, format. So yeah, feel feel free to ask questions. And uh, these topics here, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about uh, stochastic de detection in the context of these two projects. Uh, um, fluorescent carbon nanotubes that can actually detect single molecules, and we're, we're applying them to bi biological systems. But, but first, I'm very proud of a, a paper that's going to be com coming out in science next month uh, on what, what I call coherent resonant transport in nanopores. Now that we're able to make nanopores that, can, uh, that are the size of single molecules, even small molecules, we're learning about very, very exotic transport behavior in them. <coughs> Okay, this is how my, my uh, lecture today is or organized. I figure I, I'll, I'll give a, a kind of a brief layman's introduction to stochastic sensors and, uh, and the, the basic idea of why nanomaterials are contributing to, to, uh, to making uh, useful tools that behave as those stochastic sensors. And then I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna talk, talk about the two projects that, that, that I just outlined. We're, we're using these molecules called single wall car carbon nanotubes and I'll give you a brief in introduction and then the, the two systems that, that I'll talk about will be uh, using carbon nanotube nanopores. This is really for the first time we're, we're, look, we're looking at using the carbon nanotube itself as a core for counting single molecules, like a single molecule key. And then uh, hopefully it won't be too much of a tra transition. Uh, we'll talk about carbon nanotubes also fluoresce in the near infrared. And this is an area that I, that I, that I started using them as sensors. And uh, we can actually get the fluorescence of the carbon nanotube to, to flicker um, in response to molecules absorbing off and on. And so, and so the question here is, is what, how, what, what can you do with su such a sensor? You can count single molecules, and, uh, and we're applying um, these sensors to self-signaling problems. And, and so I'm going to, we'll do an in-depth e example of, of how you can use those stochastic sensors to, to solve problems that mm -hmm. no one else has been able to solve. Okay, so I'm pretty excited. In, in fact, um, so, 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 stochastic sensors. I, 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 I want to ask how many, how, how many of you, uh, how, how many of you own a car? <laughs> all, all of you? Okay, great, great, great. Good. So, the, 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 raise your hand very, very, very high. If you, okay, great, great. Well, uh, well, how many, how many have driven in a car before? How, how many of you are uh, electrical engineers? Oh, okay, great, great. Now, I was going to ask if you're so your your car today is, is actually um, is actually uh, drastically more sophisticated than it was you know when your if, if your grandfather owned a car. Or, um, there are sensors all over it. There's there, there's one one very important sensor in your car is actually one that detects oxygen. And this is a uh, not not so much a, a recent development, but if you if you looked on the underbody of your car, some of your engineers. Do, do, do any of you tinker with cars or put them together? Hi. <coughs> Just to let you know that uh, roughly half of the students are from Taiwan. It's actually quite expensive to own a car. <laughs> That's okay. They, so half the class owns cars, and the other half is driven in a car. So okay. it's a, I don't think there's any cultural friction here. I, I, I think this is good. No, I need to talk about the oxygen sensor in the, in the car. I, I think I'm okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to use it as an example, um, and I'm sure we're 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 all interested in technology, so I'm sure that you would know how things work. Anyway, this this could be a sensor in a in a chemical plant, or it could be an environmental sensor. sensor. But your car has a very inexpensive um, a, a, a aluminum oxide sensor that op operates at pretty high temperature. It goes it goes into uh, it, it it measures the the, the, the oxygen that's um, that that's present in the fuel stream. Of your vehicle, and it does this to control emissions and also to, to keep the the combustion happening. Uh, uh, and it, it, it's a it's a very typical sensor. It's a great place to start be, be, be because it, it operates very simply. You uh, you place 12, 12 volts across the sensor, and uh, depending upon the oxygen concentration that it measures, so you 
the, the oxygen sensor will report a voltage, and that voltage corresponds to some, some ratio of fuel to oxygen. So this is a very, very typical sensor. And, uh, and it works pretty well, it's reliable. So the, the question to start, to start to ask, so here, if you take a look at the size scales here, you have, uh, this sensor is about one centimeter long, and, and an oxygen, a diatomic oxygen molecule is about 0.12 nanometers. Okay, so there's a, there's a big disparity between the, the size of this tran tr transducer and the molecule it's detecting. But uh, what happens if we take the sensor and we shrink it down to, to molecules that are in the, that, that are of the size um, of the, the thing that you're, that you're detecting? So that, these molecules are called single-walled par carbon nanotubes. I've been studying them for the past, uh, for the, for the past uh, 10, 10 years. And uh, they're, they're, carbon, they're carbon frameworks. These look like chicken wire cylinders, but they're, they're conducting. So you can actually use them as, as an electrical element, just like this oxygen sensor. And uh, what, what, what happens when you, we, we can take a look at some, some of the time scale, the, uh, the length scales here. So the, you know, not, to, not to go overboard board here, but, but uh, you have the uh, uh, carbon nanotube is, the, is the, one of the first sensors that, that we have that's, um, that's a, a robust tra transducer at the, at, at the nanometer scale and, and below. So you have, you, you have the, the atomic scale, the things that you're, you're detecting. They're, they're in the, they're below one, one nanometer. And now we're making sensors and tra transducers that, that can operate in, in this realm. And this is very different from, from, from when we had, um, if, if you look, look up your, if you, if you look at the several orders of magnitude difference between uh, the, the oxygen sen sensor, which is up here at one, one centimeter, and these, these new tra transducers. And uh, you, you see this across uh, many areas of nanotech technology. You're seeing now platforms, when you shrink a sensor down to the nanometer scale, you're, you, begin to, you begin to be able to detect single molecules, stochastic fluctuations. And the question is, what, what does science do with that? And this is an open-ended lecture in that we're, we're, we're still learning. And uh, this is one example I wanted to, 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 to highlight. Um, this is an example from one of my colleagues uh, at, uh, at the University of California, Irvine. And uh, is, he's a Phil, Phil Collins, and he showed that, so here he's taking a carbon nanotube, and he places a, an electrical, uh, a, a voltage across the carbon nanotube. And, um, and then as, the, as a single defect in this nanotube interacts with a certain or, organic molecule, he can actually see what, what looks like noise at, at first, you, you, you can zoom in, and on the baseline, he's actually able to show that you're, at, you're able to detect the stochastic fluctuations of, in, in this case, this molecule is undergoing a reaction to a mixed urea. But, uh, but this is now becoming very, 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 very common. In fact, uh, in fact uh, I'm, I'm going to present two other systems where we have these nanoscale transducers that can detect and sort uh, single molecules. And the, the advantages there are that we, we've, uh, in science, we've never had the the, the prospect of, of this level of, of detection in devices that are so small. And so uh, this, this the device that uh, Phil Collins is, is using is, is really only, the device itself can be fairly miniaturized. You could imagine it be, being in a watch, um, or, or a, you know, there, there's some fairly sophisticated electronics that, have, that, that, that are peripheral. But uh, the, the prospect of taking a, a room full of molecules like, like this and, and sorting through each one and looking for uh, for harmful agents or agents that are uh, damaging to 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 the environment. And this is going to, I think, uh, have a have a significant role in in shaping our technology, in our, our technological future. And uh, but but nature has been do, doing this for a very long time. And uh, and, and in fact, uh, the the first um, I would say just from 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 my pers perspective as a research a area. The, the first uh, man-made attempts to make transducers that could actually catalog single molecules came from uh, ion channel experiments. So just one, one area of science that, that's a few, few decades old now is to, is to take, um, nature uses these sensors uh, uh, called ion, ion, chan ion channels. There's one, one that's very ro robust and, and, and well, what well studied is, is out, out the hemolysin. It's actually a bacterial endotoxin. And uh, what, what it does is if it, when it encounters a lipid bilayer membrane, it, it, will actually, it has a section that will, 
partition into the membrane and make a hole. And, and then it has this, this, um, this uh, exterior portion that, that provides a channel that's almost infinitely <coughs> customizable. And you, you, you can actually make this channel so, so that it can, it can recognize and, and sort a wide variety of molecules and, and then count the potential, you, you can count the potential changes as, as the molecule enters. And this is a, a very well established uh, area of, of, of science, the, the, the study of these, of these ion channels. How, how many have, have encountered these in your research or, or in, your, in your studies? How many are seeing these for the first time? Okay, 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 great, 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 great. Well, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about synthetic equivalents to these, these ion channels. In fact, um, uh, so in a typical experiment, what researchers would do is they would, they would after purification of this alpha hemolysin, they would make um, they would make a support over a, a pressure differential apparatus here. So these are these are two liquid reservoirs connected by this by this tubing with equilibrated pressure, and and uh, over a over a scaffold, this could be a membrane with a with that's that's porous. They put uh, they form a lipid bilayer. It's pretty easy to do that. You can just take lipids; they'll self-assemble in, into a bilayer, and they'll look just like a, 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 a cell membrane. And then what you do is you, you just add alpha hemolysin at very low low amounts uh, until you think you have one uh, one ion channel spanning spanning these these two reservoirs. And what you can do is you can you can then apply an electrical current. Um, in, in both reservoirs, and then if there is a uh, you if if there's an ion channel that connects these two these two um, reservoirs, you'll you'll measure a current, a very small small current, and the idea is that anything that that blocks this this pore will cause a stochastic diminution in this in this current, and that's that, that's called the Coulter effect. We're going to take a look at the Coulter effect in more de de detail in, in a couple of slides. But I just wanted to, 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 to show you that there's a, this is a review from two, 2001. Now there's a, there's a whole area of, of science uh, that looks at applications of these kind of ion channels, that um, biological systems are exquisitely sensitive at, in, de detecting, um, in detecting certain, uh, cer certain species, certain analytes, and um, we want to try to mimic that in man-made devices. But these, these biological ion channels have, have suffered. So, so there, are, there are versions here that can de detect, uh, they can de detect single, uh, single ca uh, cations, um, other or organic species. They can do clever tricks where they'll push, where, where they put a polymer chain and put something that, that can bind to, 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 to the end, like a biotin, and you, you can detect larger molecules like pro proteins here. Mainly, these sensors have been the domain of just of just studying whatever attaches to to them. Uh, being bi biological, you could you couldn't use them in your car, for example. I mean, they, they they're they're not ro robust enough. These these lipid bilayer housings are very fragile, and so there there's been a push to to try to make inorganic e equivalents uh, of of these. And there's there, there's great work here happening on on camp campus. Um, Greg Tim in a Electrical engineering is making these inorganic, um, these uh, inorganic uh, slides. And, and if you take a look, there, there, there's, there are also efforts to make uh, arrays of, of these pores. But the underlying problem is, is that there, they, um, there, there's a constant search for new matrices that can keep these pores stable. So it, it, would, it would be great to, uh, uh, for, for example, you, you could have very exquisite sensitive arrays that could de detect. And identify a variety of molecules you could make um, if, if you could put these sensors in, in, in parallel and, and uh, electrically address each one. Which um, so, but these are efforts, and this is a review from two, 2001. So, so there's a <coughs> working on, on this. One of the advantages is that um, nature already expresses channels that can that can detect the things that you want, like cholesterol, and, and uh, uh, there are, are there are a wide variety of pharmaceuticals that act on. Uh, ion channels, and so and so there's some advantage to that. I'm going to talk about my my work. Um, it, the two 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 major areas that we've been that, that we've been in, advancing. First, we're we're one of the first groups to use the carbon nanotube, which I'll I'll explain uh, as a as a nanopore for for detection um, and for counting single single molecules. And in fact, um, 
and, uh, and so I'll just talk about, about this. This is, so carbon nanotubes, I've, I've already did, discussed them to, to some, some extent. You're, you're familiar with the graphite in your pencil, right? If, you have, if you're writing with a pencil. Um, one, one sheet of graphite is, is called graphene. So here the carbon atoms uh, form, form these in-plane bonds. Uh, graphene is a two-dimensional electronic material. You know, at the start of the start of the lecture, I talked about these these, these low-dimensional sy systems. Literally, in graphene, the electrons can only move in in two dimensions. And uh, by restricting their dimensionality, you give the material very unusual properties. And uh, the same is true if you roll graphene into a cylinder, you make what's what's called a, a single wall carbon nanotube. And uh, this is a, a one-dimensional cage for the electron. The electron is delocalized in the circumferential space. And so it, it really can only, it literally you expand its wave vector in, in well, just along the length. So it's a one dimensional material. And uh, roughly a diameter of a nanotube is about one, one nanometer. It can become larger, they, they're less interesting when they're larger in diameter. Um, but um, we're not gonna talk about it when, when I talk to engineers and, and scientists, they, 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 they often ask, how are car carbon nanotubes made? Um, I could spend a whole lecture on, on that. But just in, in general, you normally take a carbon precursor, like a hydrocarbon or acetylene or e even ethanol, the same, the same kind of ethanol you, you drink. All of these things, when you heat them up to high temperatures, uh, condense carbon. And the trick is to condense the carbon over a nanoparticle. So if you have a nanoparticle, and there are a variety of metals that do this, uh, roughly around one nanometer in diameter, <coughs> the carbon will condense form a, form a uh, it's a little more co complicated than, than, than this, but it forms a coating on the particle. And you, you, you can imagine that that coating deforms outward and forms this, this, this polymer. You can, you can grow carbon nanotubes today like, like grass. You can actually uh, spread catalysts along a surface and, and like grass, you, you can grow, grow them up. And there's, there's actually very, very little that limits their, their length. You can grow centimeters long nanotubes that are like uh, carbon, carbon polymers. And so uh, to, to those outside the field, though, they are a, um, they're a very diverse class of materials. And we're going to come back. And the, the first thing we're going to talk about is just using the fact that they're tubular, that, that, that they, are, that they, that they per, per provide a pore uh, that you can put molecules in and, in and out of. Later, we'll come back to the fact that they're actually very chemically diverse. In fact, uh, depending on how you roll the graphene sheet, this is graphene, if I roll it so that this uh, if I roll it along this axis, can, can, connecting these two two parts, I make a I make a certain kind of nanotube that happens to, to, to be metallic. I can roll the nanotube in a different way, and I make a semiconductor. And then there are, there are also these species called called, called semi-metals. And uh, all of these have very diverse properties. In fact, that's why it, it's really taken ten year ten years, and I'm still very interested in, in these molecules. Um, they're a very diverse class of species. Uh, later in the talk, we'll talk about just these, the, the semiconductors. They fluoresce in, in the near infrared. But for now, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about actually doesn't really, um, uh, is, is not, at first order, is not, not affected by the type of nanotube. I, I think that graphene is the only material that has this property where, where you can make a whole different species just by changing a, a set of bonds. Okay, that's your crash course on, on carbon nanotubes. We're, we're going to come back to the semiconductor nanotubes. It's, uh, I've been working in this in this field for for ten for, for ten years, and um, it's hard to give you a perspective. I've always wanted to study the interior of the nanotube. It's a molecule about a nanometer in diameter, and it's essentially a big tube. So it, it's just asking to have molecules go go through it. And um, and uh, there have been the people who have really investigated putting molecules inside the nanotube have been the molecular di dynamicists. They uh, they get fascinated be, be because it's a it's a closed system and it's, it's easy to, to 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 study and they've been publishing papers making very significant uh, predictions. They predicted that water would flow enormously fast through through a carbon nanotube for its size, um, and they talked about how their these uh, nanotubes could could make for revolutionary new new fuel cell membranes, um, membranes that could conduct protons very very selectively at high rates. You could, you could store energy. You can actually sequence DNA with your nucleotides. Um, 
for example, through, through nanopores in, in, in general, there's a, there's a sub substantial effort to try to, to try to put DNA through a, through a nanopore and, and actually sequence the nuclear ba bases as it goes through. Um, but also border desalinization. De and if, if you look, the, the number of pu pu publications just from theorists and simulators is growing, is growing really, really steeply. And um, so they, they continue to fascinate scientists. And uh, we decided that we were going to be the first. Actually, this is um, uh, a graduate student who, uh, who just graduated uh, last fall and is now doing a postdoc, uh, interestingly enough, here at the University of Illinois. Actually, it's in the, in the back, back room, Chang, Chang Yun Lee. Um, this was the last part of his thesis. And so, um, and he's now doing a postdoc with uh, John, John Spiegler on, on campus. And so we just keep shuttling back and forth between the University of Illinois and MIT. Anyway, um, this was a very so uh, this was a very elegant solution to this problem. Um, it, it's actually uh, that's actually very difficult to connect the interior of a car carbon nanotube. Nobody had ever done this before. Um, what Chang Young decided to do was he grew carbon nanotubes uh, very long and aligned using using get gas flow. This was an established pet technique. You put catalyst here, put the wafer inside of a furnace. You use the gas flow to grow. Very long carbon nanotubes that are that are uh, that, that are aligned, and then he made this. The big innovation was actually this epoxy mold. You just squish it on the sur surface; it makes two reservoirs. You do an oxygen plasma edge, and you've done the epoxy structure acts as the mask, um, and also it, then it provides the the liquid to, to hold um, to uh, it hold, provides the reservoirs to hold the liquids on either side. And so you make a device, it's a, it's a large device, it's of the same scale as that oxygen sensor that we showed you before. But you can put liquid in both, both sides, you put electrodes on both, both sides, and if, if there's an open nanotube, you will, you'll detect uh, current as ions go from one, from one side to, to the other. Okay, so this is, the, this is a, a, a crash course in, nano, in uh, nanopore de detection. If, if you're getting, if you're getting electrical current through a very small nanopore, uh, then the way to prove that is to block that nanopore with some with something that's commensurate in size. And so, uh, what you what you what you would do is, if if you, if you had an anode and a ca cathode, you would stick in a molecule that would plug this hole. And what happens is, when the molecule enters, you'll get a very sharp, very fast diminution. And for as long as the molecule is inside the pore, so the, the current is going to drop by the amount that's carried by the pore. Okay, and when it when it pops out the other side, your current is is, is restored. And a different mo molecule, maybe one that has a tighter fit and, and is more snug, would would cause a bigger drop and maybe have a longer time. And then you you, you can also have uh, another molecule that that has a different. Anyway, you learn a lot from this trace. This effect is called the Coulter effect. It um, it comes from <coughs> Wallace Coulter in the 1950s, and uh, if you, you're familiar with Beckman Coulter, uh, um, the company, so he made these sensors that could count particles and, 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 could, count, and could count cells. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and the, does the current, uh, the electrical current drop? The electrical with the molecule size? Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, in fact it was first, um, it was, um, Yes, so uh, roughly the size of, of, of the molecule. In, in, in fact, in, in larger pores, there's more of a continuum uh, to, to make this true. But uh, roughly, you can tell the, the size of the molecule by the extent of this dip. The idea is that if a very small molecule is here, part of the current can still pass by it. Now, actually, some of those rules and then interpretation um, changes. I'd, I'd like to think that while it's cold, Coulter would, would, would kind of smile on, on our work. We've taken this effect and we've, we've really pushed it to the extreme. I mean, now we have we have a nanopore that that um, that uh, maybe he could have, have envisioned or not. But we're 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 doing what he did with particles. Um, we're we're doing with single molecules, and I think that's going to, to have a pretty pretty pro, profound effect. Anyway, this is called the the Coulter effect. Um, you can learn a lot about your molecule. Uh, how how fast it goes <coughs> in your pore. This this is called called the dwell time. Okay, um, so we were very pleased. This is this is our setup. We have electrodes 
on, in, on, in, in, on either side. And we were, uh, I, I still remember the, the day that uh, Chang Young started to show me these stochastic diminutions after we, we, we did a lot of, we studied uh, a fair amount of interesting phenomena that we never really have any interest in publishing, what um, transport of liquids on the outside of the nanotube and, 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 uh, and through other kinds of defects in the structure. Um, the, the signature that you're getting transport through the nanotube is you get these stochastic fluctuations. And so this is one of the first data sets that we, we produced. And uh, what's actually happening here, and I can show you proof, is that the, um, what, what we later, through, through, through some sleuthing, uh, it's actually the protons in the water that are flowing through the baseline normally. Okay, so normally the if, if there was nothing blocking, you would have a nice ba baseline um, pro protons go, going through. And then what, what what happens is if we add some sodium chloride, it's uh, predominantly the sodium cation that goes inside the pore that plugs it up. It's a very rare event, but when it does, it makes this it makes this uh, downward diminution. And uh, and this is the first time science has been able to count single cations with a with a with a room temperature device without you know some or, or quadrupole mass spectrometer. Okay. You can tell a lot from these traces. These are called culture tra culture traces. And this is actually uh, a paper that's going to be published in, in science next next month um, uh, hopefully. It's, well it's it's accepted. I don't know when it's it's going to appear. Which uh, from the from the number of states these, these flat port, port portions, you can tell how many nanotubes are contributing to the current. So, for example, in this case, if we do a, uh, then this is the current and this is the time in, the, in these axes. This is how this data is normally presented. Um, the, uh, you, you can see from the three peaks here, these three states mean that there are two swings. There's an, there's an um, both open, one open, and there's both, both closed. But you can find lots of cases where there's just one nanotube open. Okay. And, and uh, so it's, it's, it's very easy to study just one open swim. And these, you can see that the dwell time and uh, the other properties change as, as you change the, um, uh, as you, uh, as you change the, the type of cation, from potassium to lithium and sodium. And uh, this is just proof that we, so we, we looked at the, the current through the nanopore without any blocking, and it's pH dependent. So at low pH, um, at, at high P, at high P, pH, we get a very small current. Um, as, as we lower the pH, there's more pro, protons around, we get a higher current. So it's very clear that the, the pH is affecting, is the, I'm sorry, it's, it's very clear that the, that protons are the dominant carrier through, through the unblocked pore. If you add a little bit of sodium chloride to the water, actually if you add a lot of it, one, one molar, instead of making the water more conductive, you actually get a, a, a decrease in the conductivity. If this slope lowers, and so that's and that's because it, these cations are clogging the, the pore. So it's a, the opposite of what you would expect if you just had nothing, uh, no, no nanopore. And then if, if you do things like if, if you change the protons out for for deuterons, um, you actually uh, you you actually see um, you actually see a, a diminution in the in the current. I guess I switched the the numbers here. You you see a you see a diminution in the current by about the amount that you would expect from, from ch changing the proton from a, to a deuteron. Okay, actually what Chang Young studied that, that went to science, for, first time uh, these nanopores started to show us very exotic behavior that we had not seen before. This is the first time science had studied such a small and high aspect ratio of nanopore. And we started to see these regular heartbeat patterns. No, normally it's, it's random. Normally you're waiting around for a molecule to randomly dif diffuse and enter the pore. You make what's, what's called a Poisson distribution. But uh, we started to see these reg regular heartbeat patterns. Uh, no, they're, they're not at 60 hertz. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, not noise. It's, uh, in fact, the, the character of the regular oscillations uh, change with the type of cation. And if you take a, a fast Fourier tra transform of this, you get, a, you get a very coherent signal. And this is not seen, never seen before for for uh, for a synthetic nanopore, and it was a very it signaled a very interesting uh, uh, set, set of phenomena. And, and it, in fact, you, you can see these these regular oscillations. Um, in, instead of having kind of random stochastic de detection, you see these very regular heartbeat-like uh, oscillations. So these actually were completely fa fascinating. We spent about uh, I don't know eight months trying to figure out what the origin is. 
And the origin is, is actually a, a phenomenon that's going to make uh, inorganic nanopore sensors, I think, much, much more robust. Um, imagine you had a process that could get your, your molecules to line up and go through the nanopore one by one so you could count them. I mean, if, if I had proposed that to you in a proposal or, or in, in talking, you would think I, I, I was nuts. But that's actually what happens here. It's actually, a, a, it's actually in fact, this is an example of what's called uh, coherence resonance. And it's the first time we, we have seen it in an inorganic nanopore uh, science. Actually, co coherence resonance is why the neurons in your brain, um, well, a variant of it is, is how your brain makes timing circuits. Actually, it's, it's been known that ion channels in neurons, for, for example, can show this kind of, kind of a, for, even though the channels are very random and operate randomly, they can make very regular signals. So this is the first time we, 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 we've seen it here. I'll just take it through the mechanism. You can take my, my word for it, too. What happens is that there's a competition between the proton and the blocking ion. The proton always wins. But in fact, the proton wins so much that it actually makes a region of depleted concentration at the pore map. It's a, um, it, it actually makes a diffusion limitation. And uh, what, as the concentration of the proton falls, <coughs> now the ion can sneak in. When the proton concentration falls, the, the ion can then sneak, sneak in. When it does, it hogs the whole channel. It, it clogs it for as long as the ion is staying inside. Meanwhile, the proton concentration is building up, waiting for this ion to pop out the other side. When it does, then the whole system starts again. There, there, there's a flushing. And, Anyway, this, uh, you can describe this with a set of six uh, stochastic differential equations mm -hmm. that describe protons going from the bulk to the pore mouth, then into the channel, and then the, the ion going from the, from the pore mouth to the channel. Anyway, if, if you simulate these differential equations, you can actually get, um, you can actually simulate this resonance condition. So with the, with the right diffusion rate constant, you actually can get, um, instead of having a random Poisson di distribution, you can get your molecules to line up very, very nicely, and they'll make, a, they'll make this coherent resonance. Okay, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop there for carbon nanotubes in, as, as a sensor. This is new work, it's open-ended. You, you, you can follow what, what we're gonna do, do, do with these. It's a, it's a new conduit, and we're really testing a lot of the, the experimental predictions. And, um, and then also, we, we, we've seen this a uh, new mechanism called coherence resonance. It, it dramatically increases the throughput of a nanopore sensor. So we're, we're getting closer to being able to catalog and entire water sets to sample. I think there'll be some interesting applications to trace ion de detection. We're worried about things like arsenic and lead impurities in, in, in our water uh, that have no safe level in, in, the, in the human body. Uh, now we have a new set of set sensors that might be able to count even a single cation of, of um, of a toxic metal. And I'm interested in look, looking at confined re reactions and, and, and reactors uh, doing catalysis one, one molecule at a time. I'm really interested in that. And uh, okay, I'm gonna switch gears. I, don't, uh, I, I hope it's not grinding gears, but I'm gonna switch, switch gears to talk about uh, nanotube fluorescence. And um, you can feel, feel free to ask, uh, to ask any questions. But I thought I would start with um, I thought I would start with uh, uh, that we're, we're going to talk about now a particular class of, of carbon nanotubes, uh, just the semiconducting carbon nanotubes. And I, I thought I would start with why the semiconducting carbon nanotubes are, are, have, have that property. And um, I think most of you will be f familiar with you know, what, what makes a, a metal conduct electrons and what makes an insulator not conduct e electrons. Is the, is the presence of an energy gap between the, what are called the valence bands. You know, so in, in solids, the electrons are organized into, into these, into these de, de, delocalized bands. Um, an insulator is just a, a metal that has a very large gap that prevents the electrons, there's a huge amount of energy needed to get the electrons to go up into the conduction band, where they, where they can flow in a wire. Or, semiconductors have a gap that's somewhere in, in between. It means that, you can do something to reasonably get the electrons up into the conduction band, but it's um, but it requires some some energy of some kind. And uh, carbon nanotubes have this exotic electronic structure because of gra graphene. You know, we don't have we don't have to be material sci scientists. This is this is these are basically the 
the valence bands and the conduction bands of graphene. It has this hexagonal shape because graphene is made up of these hexagonal units. But basically, the strange thing about graphene is that it's a metal along certain points in this, in this, in this uh, what's called the brief pre one zone. And it's a semiconductor along other axes. If, if I look at graphene along this axis, I have to see a gap. And, but if I look at it along these points where the valence and conduction bands touch, it looks like a metal. So, uh, so gra graphene has built into it this duality, this kind of strange, strange behavior. And in fact, if you map this onto a two-dimensional uh, realm, what, what happens is when you roll the carbon nanotube, you can strain the electrons in just a certain path in this space. So the difference between graphene and a nanotube is that when you roll the gra graphene into a, nan a nanotube, the electron really can only um, only sample this this uh, very restricted domain in the Brillouin zone. And uh, the rule is pretty clear: if you if these lines intersect one of these met metallic nodes, you get a metal. We're not going to talk about those. We're going to talk about the, the cases where these lines don't intersect this metallic node, and we have a semiconductor. Okay. Um, not to uh, not to overwhelm me here, but there, there's a nomenclature for naming carbon nanotubes. It's the vector that touches the two points. Um, so this is the point. This is a this is a 1010 carbon nanotube. It's literally 10 hexagons in this direction, 10 hexagons in this direction. Make this vector that connects between these two. So so you would connect those two, and you make the the metallic nanotube. Uh, the 1010 nanotube. And uh, these are called armchair nanotubes. You're, you're supposed to be sitting here, and these are the arms of the, of the chair. And uh, these armchair nanotubes, if you if you take an electron and you confine it into a nanotube or a nanowire, you make a, um, th th this is go, go, going back to this plot of uh, density of electronic states. This is a number of electrons sitting at a certain energy. You get these very sharp uh, energy levels. Uh, these are called van Hope singularities, and they're they're what we're going to talk about in a in a minute. But you can there are lots of nomenclature. There, there's a, there are a lot of other nanotubes you can go to find. There's this 10 five nanotube, and um, this is called the chiral nanotube, and these happen to be to, to be semiconducting. They have a semiconducting gap, and so we'll talk about why that's why that's important. We're used to taking we're used to taking a look at these gra graphing sheets. So I'm, 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 I hope you're not I hope you're not lost in looking at this. I, uh, this is my only joke in the entire in the entire lecture. So there's no there's no other jokes coming. So uh, that was your chance to laugh. Uh, anyway, we're we're um, no hopefully the, the, so there was a little bit of material science that I needed to to um, to you know, really solve solid state solid state physics. But um, but now we'll talk about we'll talk about sensors. But we'll 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 need that we'll need that nomenclature. So this, um, you're, you're used from your physical chemistry. Um, this well, one-dimensional density of states. If you're, you're you're used to in your general chemistry class, you you uh, normally talk about molecules. You, you you would make this plot this way, and talk about optical excitation. These are carbon nanotubes in a cuvette. They're fluorescing in the near infrared. What you're doing is you're actually uh, shining light at one wavelength. And you're exciting an electron from the valence band, it's the conduction band. And then that excitation will decay, it's called an exciton. It'll decay to the band gap and then it'll fluoresce. And you're seeing that fluorescence with an off-the-shelf digital camera. You can vary the excitation energy. You, you can actually vary this excitation energy. And as you become resonant with particular nanotubes, uh, different kinds of nanotubes, you'll actually get an emission maximum. So there are lots of different nanotubes, and they all emit at different wavelengths. And this is a nice way to map them. So if I, if I change this laser pointer uh, wavelength, I, I can kind of highlight these, these Van Hoek singularities, the, these, these resonant tra transitions. And uh, carbon nanotubes, from a sensor standpoint, actually have some, some, some advantages. They're completely non-photoleaching. Um, they can with, withstand a very, uh, a very large uh, fluence. This is a, a normal molecule that you that, that you would use for say um, biological monitoring. This is a endocyanin green. It, it photo bleaches readily. There's something about the the nanotube that makes it one of the only fluorophores that are non non photo bleaching. And uh, also the, the the human body is particularly tra transparent in the near infrared. And I've used this in my own work, making sen sensors that can can be placed in, inside tissues and. Um, 
you're you're not transparent because uh, the heme in your blood blocks most of the most of the visible light. But there is a region where you're relatively trans translucent, I would say, in the near infrared. And the problem is we have very few materials that absorb and emit in the near infrared. Uh, but carbon nanotubes can can do that. And I, I spent a lot of my work looking at mechanisms. We're not going to talk about that today. Mechanisms by which you can modulate this emission. And uh, I'll just take you through some some of uh, so one one of my first uh, graduate students invented a glucose sensor, uh, and so he put this enzyme glucose oxidase onto a nanotube. Uh, glu glucose can react at, at the enzyme and it optically switches the nanotube. And, uh, and Paul Paul Barone showed that you could make little tiny optical sensors that, that that could go inside inside tissue or inside mice, and you you could excite them with a with a laser pointer and look at the emission off and, and measure glucose. And in fact, Paul and I are starting a company in the Cambridge area to commercialize these, these kinds of near infrared glucose sensors. I'm going I'm to skip over some of this and talk about, um, let's go to single molecule de de detection. Um, so actually if you, it was really the, the construction of more sensitive microscopes that, all, that allowed us to start to see that if you look at the emission from one, well first, you can make a microscope with a near infrared camera and if you disperse single nanotubes onto a surface, you'll see these fluorescent dots. That's a single nanotube. It doesn't show up like a, like a long rod because um, you're, you're, limited by the diffraction, you're limited by the diffraction limit in, in optics. And so, the, and so the diffraction limit blurs this into a spot. But that's actually a, a single nanotube sitting all on, on the surface. And um, if, if you actually study the, if, if you actually study this light coming out, you'll see that it's perfectly flat, a little bit of noise, Perfectly, um, perfectly stable. But if you put something like hydrogen peroxide on top of it, you begin to see this flickering. You see the, you, know, you see this flickering. This flickering is actually common. It's it's common with a variety of um, molecular fluorophores. It's uh, it, it's common also in quantum dots. But carbon nanotubes. So I should put my control here actually for I can't fit it on, on the slide. But um, Carbon nanotubes show no photoleaching. I, sh I showed you before, and they don't blink. So normally, this without the hydrogen per per peroxide, this baseline is very 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 stable. You know, we started to see this flickering, and this flickering is very quantized. In fact, this was a uh, Hung Jin, also a recent uh, graduate from my lab at, 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 at MIT. She studied this kind of flickering. The, you see that the the emission is actually transitioning between. Dis discretized states. In fact, this looks a lot like, this data looks almost completely like the single molecule stochastic transport, right? In fact, in fact, all of these nano sensors are giving us data that looks like this, right? It's very, um, and uh, with this ability to count single molecules. Hung Jin and I really wanted to apply these sensors to biological systems. So she made this collagen film. And actually, she found some long nanotubes. So some of these, if, if the nanotube is very long, and you can see the diffraction limit, you see this glowing, glow, 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 glow around. So she, she placed them in this collagen film. And then we spent a lot of time working out the mathematics of how you turn this stochastic, uh, uh, how, how do you turn this uh, essentially noise fluctuation into a real signal? I'm actually going to skip over that in, in, um, in time. You use an algorithm called hidden Markov modeling. But I, I don't think we should, I don't think we'll have to really Cover it. I want to get more to um, to what you can do with um, what you can do with the, sen the sensors. First of all, sensors like this that can detect single molecules. The thing that they give you is the, the output that they provide is actually the rate constant k. Okay, so instead of telling you a concentration, they give you a rate constant, and that rate constant is concentration dependent. So this is basically every time you have a a, a quenching event. Uh, where the intensity goes down, that's a molecule absorbing. So that contributes to this K absorption. Every time the, the curve comes up, that's a desorption. And that contributes to this de desorption rate constant. And you can see here that the adsorption rate constant increases with concentration. The desorption rate constant re really does that. And uh, Hung also used this man manganese oxide just to prove that if she, this is a catalyst that grinds up the, it, it chews up the hydrogen peroxide, and as it gets chewed, chewed up, you get a restoration. So, so she was, she's just making me get very clear that this response is from the hydrogen peroxide. And uh, she invented this, this film 
that allowed us to very selectively detect hydrogen per peroxide uh, to the exclusion of a lot of other things that would complicate uh, a cellular measurement. Okay, so at this point, uh, we have published a, a paper on stochastic sensors. This is, I actually, I, I actually lied, this is the second joke in the second talk. It went over equally well. Uh, there's no, 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 no response. Anyway, this is supposed to be a fluorescent carbon nanotube interviewing for a job. Um, and uh, so, so it says on your CV you can detect sing, single molecules, right? But, how, but uh, how do we apply this to cell, cell signaling? In fact, we, we, have a, um, we have a paper that just came out er, earlier this year in Nature Nanotechnology where we're, we're, we're trying to teach the, the community what you, what, what you can do with these stokes. Mm -hmm. A little bit of time, time left here. But um, we decided to, to study, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a crash course in a bi biological problem. Uh, a very, very well-studied membrane protein is called uh, EGFR, it's called Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor. And it, it's the model, it's, it's one of the model signaling proteins in that, that's operative in, in, in many areas of your body. Basically, it's, it's part of, a, it's called a tyrosine kinase, it's part of a signaling mechanism that nature has, uh, basically growth factors bind to the outside portion of this, of this membrane. And what this does is, is it, it causes, um, uh, it causes this molecule then to participate in phosphorylation reactions, certain kind of chemical reactions that then cause other things to happen and then other things and other things. And, and, and this is a signal. This is how the cell uh, responds to this, to what are normally growth factors or other kind of signals that it's, it's collecting from, from other cells. Uh, not surprisingly, in, in cancer, this, um, this pathway, which is related to, to cell growth, becomes corrupted, and tumor cells will often dramatically overexpress this e, EGFR. Okay, this is a very well studied area. Uh, many biologists and biochemists have had, there's a huge volume of literature. Um, and in fact, it's a huge industry. Monoclonal antibodies to block this protein are, are over a billion dollars a year. Okay, it's, it's actually an anti cancer therapeutic uh, to try to shut down this pathway. So the, the idea is to try to use this to target cancer cells to try to... Um, and uh, we, we studied a very strange result by, a, by another lab, Eula and coworkers. This protein seems to make hydrogen peroxide uh, at, at the protein itself. And in fact, if this is, you know, I'll just take you through the, this is, um, I'll just show, just show you this as proof, or you can take my, my word for it. Here, they're, they're basically showing that um, if they add the, EGF is the molecule that EGFR wants to respond to. When they add it, they, they see the molecule and they see its response is the phosphorylated version. Um, if they add this molecule called catalase, that, this catalase destroys hydrogen peroxide. They block the signal. Okay, so if you had cat, cat, catalase, you block the signal. Um, they had a hard time proving that hydrogen peroxide was being generated at this E, e, EGFR um, and participating in the signal. But it was very clear if you interrupted this top hydrogen peroxide, you blocked this very important, important signal. And in fact, their, their model is very controversial. In fact, my student, Hung Jin, when she was trying to defend her thesis, the thesis committee um, was even very skeptical that these, they weren't skeptical of our work, they were skeptical of the fact that, the fact that these proteins were even producing hydrogen Peroxide, but it's very, it's very clear. In fact, there's, there's this very strange model by the Ula and coworkers where the molecule comes in and binds to the membrane protein, and hydrogen peroxide is made at the, at the, at the, on the outside portion, and then this hydrogen peroxide has to diffuse back in, and and only phosphorylation can only happen when the, when when that process proceeds. And there are two different mechanisms, but they both involve hydrogen peroxide having to be made and go back into the cell. Nobody understands why nature, do, nature does this. And, and the, the problem is there's no way to detect the hydrogen peroxide coming from a single membrane protein or from membrane proteins. In fact, so uh, it was an excellent a application of, of, of our work. It's a, it's a signaling problem that no one else can, can detect. So, so Hung put these cells, these A431 human carcinoma cells, she put them on top of these collagen film um, uh, 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 arrays here. So underneath the cell, you see the stochastic function, and you can actually count the molecules that are being emitted by the membrane protein sitting in the cell. And this was a an absolute first in science. 
Um, it's not that there's noise. When you don't put the cell down, you don't see any tra transitions, right? These, the signal to noise is infinite. When you put the cell down, in its footprint, you see, you see lots of counts. These are the molecules of hydrogen peroxide detected per 150 seconds. These are units that, uh, that, that hung, that, that hung, hung use. It's, a, it's using all the information in a frame, which was 150 seconds. But this is single molecule hydrogen peroxide detection from a single living cell. This is the first time in science. So you're actually seeing, seeing this hydrogen peroxide coming up. And if you, uh, in case you're skeptical that it's hydrogen peroxide, we did a lot of controls, uh, really for homeostasis to just really make, to make it clear. You, you can add manganese oxide. So if you add manganese oxide, um, the, the signal, even in the presence of the cell, will, will diminish. Okay, so, and, uh, Hung did a number of other things though, if you use, so these are 3T3 cells. Everywhere in red, it's not really showing up as well as, as it is in my lab, that must be the projector here. So, but in 3T3 cells, you're supposed to see that there's not a lot of red here. That's the e, e, EGFR. And so we don't see a lot of hydrogen peroxide produced in response to e, EGF. Um, the A431 cells, you see a very big response. And so, the, and, and there's a lot of red here. So we, we show this, this correlation between the two. Hung showed one other thing that I'll end with, and that's, uh, so what can single molecule arrays tell us that, that a regular sensor that operates like that oxygen sensor uh, can't, can't, tell, can't tell us? And it turns out that an array of single molecules, molecule sensors, can actually tell you where the molecules are originating from, like a focal plane. And this is something we showed mathematically. Imagine hydrogen peroxide raining down onto a bunch of sensors. Imagine that I'm on a roof taking uh, billiard balls and throwing them into a bunch of barrels, you know, um, on, onto the ground. Uh, I'll, fill the, I'll fill the barrels to different extents, right? And what I can do is I can rank order these. I can take the largest filled, filled barrel, put it first, then, then the next and the next, and end with the smallest. If you rank order the sensors um, in terms of the most filled and versus the least filled, you get a, a curve that's very well described mathematically. In fact, that process of randomly raining down onto set sensors that have an equal probability of, cap of capturing each one, that's called a binomial pro process. And this curve is called, the, you, can, you can just derive it. It's, it's, a, it's the inverse incomplete gamma function. So it's, it, Mat MATLAB has this, and you can use it, you can look it up in Mat Mathematica, or you may have encountered it in your graduate work. Okay, what happens is, if there's, on top of this, if there's local generation, like from a membrane, okay, the local generation shows up as a perturbation to the binomial process. So what happens is the, the, the hydrogen peroxide that's generated actually causes a, a deflection in this curve. You know this curve quite, quite well. So what you can do is you can, you can actually take the, you, you can actually isolate the membrane response by subtracting out the, you can subtract out the, the, um, the binomial process. There's no fitting here. You can actually use the low rank region to fit the binomial process. Not fit, but with the set. So there's no adjustable parameters. You just use this region to set gamma. And then what's left over is the membrane contribution. Anyway, so we showed that these sensors can actually, can actually isolate from this hydrogen peroxide mess the exact contribution in red here. That's the exact contribution of the hydrogen peroxide generated from the from the membrane from the membrane proteins. Um, which is a which is a first in science. You, you can actually isolate that that, that signal. And um, and with that and, and so we, we we did a lot of work um, on on this mechanism, but I'm gonna I'm gonna end there and um, talk about future work. We um, we're making sensors now for, um, we're interested in sensing problems that have been traditionally very difficult. This is a paper that we published in, uh, in Nature Chemistry, where we made a polymer that wraps around the nanotube that can detect nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is another one of these very reactive signaling molecules. And we show here that we can detect it with high selectivity. And uh, we made the first reversible nitric oxide sensor. There's actually nothing else like it. You can't, uh, it has no analog. And so, um, and uh, I have a student, Jingxing Zhang, who is working on using um, uh, 
uh, making sensors, making platforms that can detect nitric oxide at the single molecule level. Okay. And with that, um, so the, the conclusions here for the second part, we're, we're basically measuring, we're using these platforms as cell signaling platforms at the single molecule level. I talked about this distinguishing the near field from the far field. Um, this was, this I, I thought was a big advance from my own community and, and my own work because we tra transitioned from making sensors and, and studying them to actually now using them to actually do new science, which is what I want to continue to do at MIT, kind of being the first to use these exotic nano sensors to, to do new science. Okay, with that, I, I will thank my, I'll thank my, my group. This is uh, Hung Jin and uh, Chang Yang Li is in the back. You can see his, uh, he's, he's here, he's also in the back of the room. And, uh, and then I, I, I also have, have to thank uh, Jing Ching Zhang, who, who is uh, not in this, not in this um, diagram, but, but, then, but then also a new student, Wan Jun Choi, who is doing more of, of these, of these nano four experiments. And, uh, and then I'd like to thank the um, several funding agencies, but, but also I'd like to thank you as, as well. Um, the the class. If I, I can answer any questions if you if you'd like.